Well, guten Morgen. It's great to be in Berlin, as I said yesterday, and it's great to see you're all here, and hopefully you've got your uh, Seattle coffee fix, or should I say your Starks coffee fix this morning, and are, are ready to go. And I kind of want to expand a little bit about what Dylan said. Uh, I'm a fidgeter. I can't sit still for very long or whatever, so I do my programming when I'm out jogging. And I work it out all in my head, and what I do on the keyboard is I just, just type it in. So that's what that's all about. So what we're going to do is a, a brief tour of the compiler. And the compiler is a gigantic, uh, complicated thing, so unfortunately, this is going to have to be a bit shallow, because um, I only got an hour to talk about it. I could probably talk about it for a month. And also, I realized, you know, a bit belatedly, that some of my slides are a little indistinct. So if you want to go to the uh, DECONF website and download the presentation and follow along on your laptops, you might find it a little easier to read. Okay, how many of you have tried to debug a mat of wires computer? Am I the only one? Oh my god. <laughs> Anyhow, that's how computers used to be built, and, and if you can debug a mat of wires, you can debug a compiler. It's good training for it. So the first thing is, you know, how the heck is a compiler organized? It's organized as a front end, and a common front end among three compilers. There's the DMD, which is based on the Digital Mars C++ compiler backend. There's GDC, which is based, the backend is based on the GNU compiler collection. And there's LDC, which uses a backend based on LLVM. And each compiler has their strengths and weaknesses. But the front end is common, you know, the old uh, one, one D to rule them all. In the last year, there's uh, been two huge changes in the compiler. One was a conversion to D, which is thanks to Daniel Murphy, who led the charge on that. It's a great relief to finally um, delete the old C++ front end, and now we have a, a D front end. So that's really nice. So the back ends still remain in their respective languages. And the other change that took uh, a considerable amount of time on my part was to dump our own custom exception handling mechanism and use the dwarf one. And the main reason it took a long time was because the dwarf one is, uh, to put it mildly, a bit underdocumented. <laughs> Every, everything you read about it says something slightly different about how it works. And the only way to get it to actually work is to build it, try it out, See where, it went, see where it goes wrong and try to figure out why it went wrong. So, but anyhow, what the C++ exception handling does is it means that it opens up a whole new era of possibilities for interfacing directly with C++, which is one of the big strengths of D. Every, every language can interface with C, but not very many can interface with C++. So if you're interested in hacking around on a compiler, the first thing, of course, is where is it? And there's the URL. And if you click on that URL, this is what, you know, you don't need to read that. It's just uh, what the uh, GitHub source page looks like. And one interesting thing is there are 14,000 uh, commits on it going back many years, and even more interesting is there are 123 contributors. So it's not just me, there's a lot of people who work on the compiler, so that means if you guys want to work on the compiler and submit pull requests, it's entirely possible. So I hope that maybe this will, in, you know, maybe inspire some people to uh, help out and make the compiler better. And this is a little roadmap of uh, where stuff is in the source tree. Um, it's, of course, the source is obviously under the source directory. And that's where the, the front end resides. That's common to everybody. 
Uh, some parts of this compiler go back to 1982. <laughs> uh, some of it's very old. I, I rewrite code, code constantly, but I don't throw away code if it's working. And so TK is, is a bunch of old uh, C code that does things like uh, bit vectors and uh, linked lists and memory management, and it's mostly used by the back end. Uh, root. Root was my original attempt to create a common C++ library amongst my code. It's since been completely supplanted by Phobos and the runtime, but as a vestige of the way the compiler used to be built, it's still there. Uh, backend is where the uh, Digital Mars C++ compiler backend, the optimizer and the code generator resides, and it's written in C++. And uh, VC build has some extra files that enable you to build it using uh, Visual Studio. The Visual Studio build is not officially supported, but a lot of people like it, so. There. Okay, so now it's time to strap on for the e-ticket ride. Okay, who knows what an e-ticket ride is? Oh my god. <laughs> okay, Disneyland up until the 80s, I think, separated their rides into the A rides, the B rides, the C rides, and on up to the E rides. So like the, um, the roller coaster was an E was an e-ticket, so then there came the term e-ticket ride was always, you know, you're getting strapped in for the good stuff, so. For some reason, so was it Small World, which was really boring. Small World was an e-ticket ride? Oh, boy. <laughs> but, like, I think, like, the teacups were a, a B ride or something like that. Okay, uh, compiler doesn't just compile. It has... Uh, um, multiple types of builds. Um, by the way, feel free to ask questions. I'm, uh, Dylan has the microphone, and it's more fun if, if you guys have questions, and uh, feel free to any time to uh, interrupt me and ask a question. So the three kinds of builds in general, although there are a whole bunch of other more minor ones, but the main ones are um, checking to see if there are errors in the source code a syntactic check on the compiler, you know, does it even compile is the first step. The next thing, and what you'll be doing uh, most of the time, is generating a debug build because development is in a perpetual edit, compile, debug loop. So the debug build emits, uh, doesn't bother trying to do any optimization. It emits a code that's more, uh, shall we say, tractable for debugger, and it emits the symbolic uh, debug information. And then once you've got it all debugged, you run the release build where um, the compiler does not attempt to be fast, it attempts to generate the fastest code. And sometimes it mangles the code so good, trying to optimize it, that it's not very debuggable, hence it's kind of a separate build option. Um, you can't use a source code debugger with the optimized build very well. It doesn't work. So the first thing about how the compiler works to understand is how the compiler does memory allocation. And how it works is a really, because it's a batch program, it, you don't really care about recycling memory. And so it just allocates memory and never frees it. This, this might be heresy, but the neat thing about it is it's actually a, a form of garbage collection, except you're, you never collect the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, advantage of it's uh, very, very fast, and you, it leaks memory like crazy, and it doesn't matter. Because when you're done compiling, the whole process is thrown away and all that. Um, Part of the speed advantage of it is you don't need to do ownership tracking. Um, the alternatives to 
Well, garbage collection, as we all know, has long pauses while it tries to find out if there are any owners. Um, it turns out that reference counting in aggregate is actually slower than garbage collection, except that slowness is amortized over the execution of the program, and you often don't notice it. But since compilation is a batch process, you would definitely notice that the reference counting is slower than a garbage collection pauses. And uh, yeah, the, the problem with reference counting is you have to increment and decrement all the time. And not only that is the decrement has to be inside of an exception handler. So that's what makes it slow and kind of bloaty. So eliminating all that, one of the reasons the compiler is so fast is it just allocates and doesn't worry about it. Never freeze memory. The downside of that is yeah, <laughs> it runs out of memory. <laughs> A few years ago, it seemed inconceivable that you could compile something that would consume four gigabytes of memory. But now that seems like almost routine for larger projects, which is kind of, uh, kind of amazing. So this is something we're going to have to sooner or later deal with in the compiler, is try to reduce its uh, wild memory consumption. Yes, sir? Are there any technical constraints that would stop code generation from also being written in D? Code generation from what? being written in D as well. This is just ah, my, so the question is, the can the back end be converted into D? Yeah. Is there anything stopping it other than just the sheer amount of work it would take? Daniel Murphy is working on that. I see. So yeah, there's been a lot of pull requests over the last year to uh, sort of get the back end in shape. So it is amenable to a translator that Daniel wrote that translates C++ code into D. And by getting it in shape, um, I mean things like getting rid of all the preprocessor tricks I was doing in the back end. Um, all the, uh, the conditional compilation, token pasting, X macros, all that stuff has to go. And then you can uh, get the thing converted over to D. And it also involves like writing in a subset that's common to both C++ and D makes it a lot easier. I know Daniel and I have argued about that. <laughs> so especially how default constructors work is different. So yes, that's the goal. Unfortunately, that won't help the, uh, have any effect on the GDC and our LDC projects. So those will probably remain, I, I believe they're written in C. They're written in C++ now? OK. Five years? Um, just yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so the LDC backend is in, uh, is in C++ too? OK. Well, this also shows one of the strengths of D is you can have a D front end and a C++ backend, and they will work together. It's hard to find that in any other language. OK, how D handles strings is a vestige of its uh, used to be a C++ program, so its strings are still zero terminated. And the root of the whole thing is this giant string table, which is in root. It's a hash table of all the strings the compiler encounters. Now, this is something that took me 10 years before I had an epiphany. <laughs> I used to do symbol table lookups by comparing the strings. So I have a, you know, a string, you know, my identifier, and I'd go looking through the symbol table doing a string comp of my identifier against the string in there, looking for a match. And I was always fiddling around trying to write a faster comparison function. And one day, it finally realized that I've been stupid. If I put all the strings into a hash table, then each, the unique identifier for every string is its address. So now I do lookups in the symbol table, or the compiler does, simply by comparing pointers. Is it the pointer match? 
Yes, it's the same string. Does the pointer not match? It's a different string. So that's one, uh, you know, really a source of a great speed up in the compiler was switching to that system. I don't know if other compilers do it or not, but if you're doing anything with lots of strings and lookups, I highly recommend this way of dealing with it. It's also very, very uh, cache efficient because you never have to go look at the string again unless you're actually printing it to the screen in the debug message. All you're dealing with are, are pointers. You never have to go and access the memory where the string is, is actually held. And identifier.id pool is the, is the function that uh, you hand it a string and it gives you a it gives you a pointer back that you use to identi uniquely identify the identifier from then on. Another fundamental data structure is it uses templates for arrays. And why on earth would it use templates for arrays? Because D has great arrays. And the answer is, well, C++ has terrible arrays. <laughs> And this is left over from the, uh, another anachronism from the C++ code. And the convention used in the compiler is if I have a string, then an array of strings is I just, you just put an S at the end, it's the plural, so strings. So it's really, it's, uh, oh, the name, Hungarian notation used correctly, actually. <laughs> So it's real easy to know, oh, I have a collection of strings here, or I just have a single string. And you'll see alias statements that uh, instantiate the various array types. So eventually, one problem, reason to keep that is the back-end code still has to access the data structures of the front-end, so you have to use a data structure that's compatible with C++ code, so we're probably going to be keeping this in the front end with zero terminated strings for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, another thing in, in there is I tried to create a single, uh, single inheritance hierarchy, and root object contains the root node for that, and you'll notice, you know, that's the same as the, uh, you know, the object in uh, decode, and that's kind of deliberate because this was kind of the prototype for the D object code system, except since this was in C++, it remained distinct from the D1, and it will remain because it still has to interface with C++ code. So it's kind of a work-alike, like the one you'll find in D runtime. And it forms a root of most of the types, including the array types in uh, internal to the compiler. Um, back in the 90s or the early 90s, OOP was the answer to every programming problem you know, object-oriented programming. If you weren't doing it in OOP, you weren't doing it right, you were behind the times, you were told to get with it. And since then, people have kind of uh, learned better, it went out of fashion, and you know, there's a new fashion every few years. And, but it turns out that the compiler's internal data structures are almost an ideal use case for OOP programming. It's just a natural fit. Expressions, statements, declarations, and classes, structs, all form a tree. And uh, with the leaves being the various kinds of expressions and statements and stuff like that. And it just works really nicely with OOP. So the compiler originally was all implemented using OOP until <laughs> Daniel Murphy again. <laughs> You should stand up, Daniel, and take a bow. He's one of the, along with Kenji, he's one of the... He's one of the MVPs in the, the DMD and community. He uh, convinced me to use the visitor pattern, that it was a better way to reduce and encapsulate some of the complexity of the compiler. So now, thanks to him, it makes heavy use of the visitor pattern. 
Um, something I should say about the compiler is, how many people have been programming for more than five years? Ever look at your code from five years ago? <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> now, I've been programming for 40 years. I still look at my code from five years ago and think, oh, God, what an awful piece of garbage that is. So I'm constantly, uh, um, computer science is moving forward and I'm trying to learn new ways of doing things and I keep wanting to throw things out and rewrite them and the visitor pattern is, although that's an older technique, it's just another example of uh, constantly learning new and better ways to do things. Okay, now, so here's the organization inside of the compiler. It's divided up into multiple passes and the passes are independent of each other. And this is a rather crucial thing because a lot of languages, they mix up lexing and parsing, they mix up which uh, C++ does. C++ also mixes up parsing with semantic analysis. Uh, you can't parse C++ successfully without examining the symbol table. Uh, D was designed so these passes have pretty sharp dividing lines between them. And not only does that reduce complexity, it also makes the entire, the compiler internals parallelizable, which to me is a fascinating concept and I've never had the time to actually work on that. But the language design so that if you had like a multi-core processor, you could, the passes can be run in parallel with each other, which would be really cool. Anyhow, the first thing it does is you put a bunch of files on the command line and it reads them. Then it passes to the lexer and the lexer splits up the, the source code into a stream of tokens. The parser takes this stream of tokens and converts it to an abstract syntax tree. Everybody know what an abstract syntax tree is? <laughs> it's it's kind of just, just what it is. It's just a, it's just a tree where the leaves are like identifiers and, uh, and numbers and string literals and the, the non-leaves are things like the multiply operator, a for loop, something like that. So they're really a, a pretty simple data structure. The next thing it does is what the parser returns is an array of declarations. Again with that oop thing. So everything, in the, everything you see in the source code turns into a declaration. Then there's another pass which walks those declarations and inserts each declaration into the symbol table. So now the compiler knows where all the symbols are in advance of anything else running, and this is crucial, because the next phase is semantic analysis. Now, the semantic analysis is currently divided into three phases, which was a huge mistake. And I'll get to that later. But the idea is, and this is poorly implemented in the compiler, but it's the goal, is in C++, if you're referencing a variable that's declared further down, you can't see it. Okay, there are no forward references except inside class declarations. You can only, it, you can only look backwards as you're moving along. <laughs> That's how the C++ language works. In D, you can see all the symbols. So you have, you can forward reference things. And how the compiler is supposed to work, but it does not thoroughly work that way yet, sadly, is if it sees a symbol it hasn't done, that it needs the semantic analysis of, like what is the symbol, what is its type, it can just call the semantic analysis, say, start the semantic analyzer on that symbol. So in other words, it should do semantic analysis on a fully uh, lazy basis, only on demand. Now once all the semantic analysis is done, now semantic analysis does things like figures out what the types of everything is, figures out, you know, is it semantically correct, like am add I, it diagnoses errors like, uh, am I adding an integer to a string? Which is legal in some languages, it's not legal in D. The next thing it does is it scans the functions looking for opportunities to inline functions. 
I know LDC at least has disabled this and does that in the back end, which, and there are certain advantages and disadvantages to where you put the inliner. For better or worse, DMD's inliner is there. After the inline function inline expansion is done, then there's the kind of crazily named uh, thing called the glue layer. <laughs> um, ever seen Frankenstein with all the uh, stitches? <laughs> That's what the glue layer is. It takes something that was never designed to work with the front end, and the front end it was never designed to work with that, and it glues them together. Uh, essentially, it translates the data structures from what the, um, the DMD front end generated into what the back end can understand. No questions yet? Come on. Either, either I'm completely going over your heads or you guys know this all cold. So. <laughs> Ali. Uh, that was there at the beginning. So the question is, has the glue layer always been there? It's, it's always been there because I needed a way to generate code and I needed to hook it up to the back end. So you could call it a bridge layer, but kind of call it a glue layer and it's stuck. Yes, sir? I can't hear you. To run the passes how? In parallel. Yes. Yes. In particular, it's easiest to see like with lexing and parsing. Lexing produces a stream of tokens. It's not dependent on any of the other imports in your system or any of your other source files. So you could have, if you were compiling, if you put 10 source files on the command line, it could start 10 lexers running on it, all running in parallel. They have nothing to do with each other, so there are no synchronization issues. And the same with the parser. Um, doing the semantic stuff, because it's lazy and it's always looking around saying, oh, I need to analyze this symbol, analyze that symbol, it's a little hard to parallelize that one. But once you get into the inlining, the inlining can be done in parallel, and the code generation and the optimization, since those are done on a function-by-function -function basis, they can all be parallelized. Um, so can you tell us where does, uh, does the, the compile time function evaluation happen? The compile time function evaluation happens as part of the semantic phase. And I will get into that later, sort of uh, an overview of how it works. So, yes, sir. I didn't realize how useful semi-formal grammar could be until I saw the language specification on the page, and that kind of, it became an academic concept to something more concrete and useful when I saw that. And I wanted to know, like, I noticed that the parser in the D language is mostly a recursive descent. Yes. And I was wondering what, what are the big barriers that stops it from being a more formal parser, parser generator, like an LALR or LL2 or... So... Why is it a recursive descent, or why did I not use a parser generator to build yeah, it? For a, for, a novice who, for a novice who doesn't know the limitations of like LL2 or LAR, why is a recursive descent needed for the D language rather than like a more fo ex exactly formal uh, specification of the language? Okay. Um, I've never used lecture generators and parser generators because they're just as much work to use them and they produce inferior results. I've always hand coded them. Parsers and lectures are easy to hand code and if you look at the source code for that, you'll see it's quite straightforward. And recursive descent is very efficient, very fast and one of the reasons I like it is it uses hardly any memory. It doesn't need to keep track of its state. Very, or it uses the stack to keep track of its state, which is a very efficient use of memory. So that's why I like it. Oh, um, sometimes people call parsers compiler compilers, which to me is a, is a sick joke, because <laughs> parsing is trivial. The real work is the uh, semantic analysis, and nobody has ever managed to automate that. <laughs> that's also where most of the problems are with a compiler. 
So after the glue layer, the next thing that happens is you run kind of a language independent optimizer on it, which, and the intermediate code is a very simplified instruction set as opposed to the full language. The full language is translated into the simplified instruction set. And that instruction set is very amenable to using uh, mathematical optimization algorithms on it. Things like, uh, how many, who's heard of data flow analysis? Yeah. Data flow analysis uh, doesn't really know anything about loops and stuff like that. It just knows about, you know, graphs and edges and things like that. So everything's converted into graphs and edges, and then you run the textbook optimization algorithms on it. Uh, but only if the optimization is turned on. And then you generate code, which is a, you know, a nightmarish topic in itself, <laughs> which we're not going to cover here. And then you write out an object file and hope it, hope it works. So the lecture is in the file, completely contained in file. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, small question. Is there any default optimization, for example, or even for debug uh, mods that uh, compiler to do? A default optimization? Yes, yes, there are default optimizations. It will do uh, what are called basic common sub-expressions and some basic register allocation, simply because if you don't do that, the code is so terrible. <laughs> It's so terrible and slow, and, and it does optimizations that, don't, that are easy to do and won't really interfere with the symbolic debugging. So yes, it does some. The Lexer is mostly concerned with speed. So it's one of those, uh, every dirty trick to make the Lexer faster, I'll do it, I have no shame. Um, because in the end result, all you care about is the speed. Um, it also rarely changes. So it's probably the most stable part of the compiler. And naturally, since it's the Lexer, it's the most, it's the most debugged. So it's a pretty solid piece of code. Not terribly interesting, anyway. Parsing, it's also simple and rarely changes. Uh, I said that the lecture produces a stream of token and is a separate pass with the uh, parser. Uh, but they are conceptually separate, they are not actually separate. And the reason is, is because if I lex it and then parse it, I have to store the stream of tokens somewhere. And memory allocation makes things slow. So the idea is, the parser goes, I need the next token, and then the, the lexer gets in gear and grinds forward one more token, says, here's the next token. And the parser, that's also, you know, part of his recursive descent. It goes, oh, I just saw an if. Eh, what's the next token? Calls the lexer, the lexer grinds forward another step, gives another token. Oh, that's the left parenthesis. Okay, I know what that is, and, and on and on. So, there are parts in the D grammar that require arbitrary look ahead, which means it can't tell what AST to build for it unless it's looked further ahead to see what's there. And in those cases, the parser kind of builds a stack or a list of tokens looking ahead. And then it figures out what's the correct parse for it. Then it backs up and it starts reading the tokens from that list until it runs out, and then it asks the lecture again, give me the next token, give me the next token, give me the next token. So most of the time, it's never storing um, any tokens. They're just passed in a variable. But every once in a while, it, when it needs to, it generates a list and then goes over the list again. Now, one of the reasons uh, I don't use a parser generator is the code to parse actually looks like the specification, actually looks like the grammar. And it looks like what you'd have to specify to the parser generator anyway, so, so who needs it? For example, this is a while. The, uh, this is actual cut and paste code for parsing and building the AST for a while loop. And you'll see first, you know, case toke while says I got a while token, so I'm here. Then it says next token, which calls the lecture, says give me the next token. And then it checks to see if the token's uh, left parenthesis. 
If it's not, it spits out an error. Then there's a conditional, which is parse expression. Checks to see it closed with the right parenthesis. Then end lock is, it, it tries to remember the location of where the end of the uh, thing is so it can generate better debug code for it, or debug, symbolic debug info for it. And it parses the statement, which is the while loop body. Now it has everything it needs and does a new while statement, gives it the condition, the body, and the end location. Well, the lock in front is the beginning location in the source file, the condition, the body, and the ending location are done. Why do why you need a parser generator? <laughs> and it's all very straightforward code. It, it reads almost like reading the grammar out of the, uh, out of the spec. So it said it uh, runs through and uh, builds a symbol table. Another thing it does while building the symbol table is it establishes a scope for each symbol. And the scope is just what you think it is. It's uh, when you have nested scopes, each of those is a separate scope. And inside functions are a scope. There's a scope inside uh, aggregate declarations and things like that. So this is established for each symbol. And it's uh, managed in uh, dscope.d. It uh, contains things like a link to the enclosing scope. And it has a bunch of fields in it, which is what module I'm in, what function I'm in, if any, you know, what storage class is in effect, like private or static or final. And, uh, you know, a bunch of other details. And um, back in my uh, more ignorant days, the C++ compiler used global variables for this, <laughs> which turned out to be an endless source of bugs. Um, and I switched to the scope system, which um, greatly eliminated large quantities of error-prone code using global variables for that. OK, the, remember the uh, semantic routines were divided into uh, three passes. Uh, the idea behind that was so it could do forward references. Um, and how it worked was the first pass would see the int a, the int b, and the int foo, and would look at the symbols and determine their type and their storage class. The second pass would then go through and read the initializers like the equals three. And the third pass would do inside the function bodies. And I thought this was a clever way to uh, make forward referencing work. Unfortunately, if you look at the Bugzilla, they have historically been an awful lot of bugs related to forward referencing not working right. And that's mainly because everything kind of points. Um, people write code that references itself in all kinds of weird ways, and it just did not work. So really, that was a mistake in the design. It really should have been only one semantic processing routine, and then everything done on demand or lazily. But there's a lot of leftover in the compiler from the way it used to be. <laughs> Lowering. Now, this is something I didn't know the right word for, and Andre taught me. It's nice having a guy with a PhD in computer science. Uh, <laughs> Um, to, to tell you when you've uh, invented something that is already known or that there is something known, well known that you should be doing. And lowering is one of those things. Um, what it is, is is as simple as rewriting an AST into a simpler, more canonical form. What it does is it winds up reducing the number of cases you have to deal with later on in the compiler, uh, which reduces the number of complexity and bugs. And also, it turns out to be an advantage when you're specifying the language, because if the compiler is lowering one syntactic construct into another simpler one, you can write the specification as saying, this is exactly the same as this. 
So it also reduces the effort and problems and special cases you have in the specification. So one of the efforts we've made in the compiler over the years is to find places where we can simplify the compiler by doing lowering. And it's really great when you find one and you can uh, be negatively productive by deleting 100 or 300 lines of code. That's always a good feeling when you can do that. I love pull requests that say, fix this feature, plus three lines, minus 200 lines. <laughs> <laughs> so I call being negatively fixed. Who gets that good feeling when they see a pull request like that? Yeah. <laughs> minus 200 lines of crap. <laughs> and you know you're making progress when the compiler is shrinking and getting more powerful. So here's a simple example. Um, the back end only supports one kind of, well, actually not even, it's lowered further for the back end. The back end only knows about go-tos. Remember I said edges? Those are go-tos. But the front end takes while loops and turns them into for loops. By those, uh, the blue line is what it turns into. Uh, the for each, and if you look at the source code to the compiler, you'll actually see this is in the comments, because that's what it's doing. The for each thing is reduced or is turned into that for loop down below. And uh, the third one is more interesting. It's how uh, these for loops recognize ranges. That's actually the code it rewrites your for each loop over range into. And that's exactly what it does. Nothing more than that. Yes, sir. Yes, but uh, for ranges, ranges don't have OP apply, so that's, what's, that's what it's done with that. OP apply has a more complex lowering because it involves creating a lambda function. <laughs> so that, that would be more than a couple of slides. But it's the same concept. Um, David. Which one? Maybe, maybe the comment's wrong in the compiler, <laughs> which wouldn't be the first time. The, yeah, David said that, that there should be a ref between the f four and the auto. I'd have to double check that to make sure they're, that that's right. Um, yes, sir. Question about the, uh, the second lowering. Is M evaluated uh, every time on every, every iteration of the loop, or is it only evaluated once? Um, I believe it's only evaluated once, so that isn't shown in there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to evaluate it every time. Yeah, um, I was a third example. Um, for ranges, it actually does uh, an implicit save on structs, so which means you have different semantics for uh, ranges that are structs and ranges that are a reference type in this case. So there's a bug request in in Bugzilla, if you want to look at it. So that's actually a bug introduced by lowering. And um, I don't believe it's a silver bullet because it also introduced some other bug, for example, on static for riches. I have a hard time understanding. Ah, sorry, French accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, lowering in the third case introduced a bug with um, ranges, um, ran, um, value type ranges because it does a save. If you have a, a class here, it doesn't do a save, so your range is advanced. If you have a struct, your range is untouched. Is that ah, clear? Ah, I see, yeah. So the question is, is it making a copy of the range or is it uh, referring to the range? If you make a copy of the range, then the original is untouched. If you're referring to the range when you're walking it, it's consuming the range. That's kind of a perennial, uh, a subtle issue with using ranges in D is when are they consumed and when are they copied. And you kind of have to carefully look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Most of the time it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. So, and yeah, that is reflected in the lowering, which, which one it's doing. The next lowering thing that turned out to be extremely helpful 
is um, all the exceptions are lower than the try finalists because exceptions are one of those really things that hurt your brain trying to figure out how they work. Um, and it's much easier if there's only one case you have to think about. So the idea is to rewrite uh, scope, uh, this, you know, this scope exit and scope failure and scope success. Those are all rewrite, rewritten into the corresponding try finally uh, statements. The synchronized statement and the RAII are also rewritten that way. That means the back end only has to deal with try finally. I only have to figure out how to get try finally right, and then everything else, all those other things are going to just work. So that was a huge, uh, huge boon, and it was a great pleasure to delete a bunch of code <laughs> when that, was, uh, that change was made. A bunch of code and a bunch of bugs just went away. Um, one interesting thing about a compiler is what do you do about errors? That's often not really mentioned in compiler books. And there are three main forms of it. Is, uh, first one is you find an error and you just quit. You print out a diagnostic message saying, well, I'm not going any further because everything is messed up. And that's, that's pretty good for, you know, like a hobby compiler or a learning compiler, that's, that's perfectly adequate. But on a professional one, especially if your compiles take a longer time, you want to collect all the errors in it and then fix them all at once and then resubmit your compile job. So it's really a productivity thing to get all the errors in one pass. One of the uh, very popular ways of doing this and it's one that I used to use extensively, and I believe Clang uses, because I've heard talks about it where they do this, is, well, all languages have redundancy in them. And you can use the redundancy, like why have semicolons and curly braces, it's to make the grammar redundant. And with the redundancy in the grammar, if there's a mistake in it, you can look at the other tokens and make an educated guess about what the user intended. Then what you do is you repair the ASTs, and then you continue parsing, looking for more errors, or compiling using the repaired things. Um, unfortunately, almost always guess wrong. And who knows about the term cascaded errors? Where you get a screen full of errors, and the advice is just look at the first one. <laughs> because the rest are all just because it incorrectly repaired things and then you get a bunch of bogus error messages. So it turns out that the guess at the user intention then repair usually devolves into the first case. And a lot of compilers implicitly do that was they have error counters. So if they print out more than say 10 errors, they go, well, these must be campaign cascaded errors, so I'll just terminate the compile and give up. Um, so, I struggled with this for a very long time, trying to make cascaded errors work, and then hit on another technique that there may be a formal name for it. I don't know what it is, but I just call it poisoning. <laughs> How poisoning works is uh, very simple. Remember the AST nodes? You know, you have uh, identifiers and numbers and strings and operators. Well, there's a special node type called error. And if, let's say I'm looking at an integer in there and the integer is, there's something wrong with it, I then replace the integer with the error node. And then when I'm doing semantic processing, or when I say I, I mean the compiler, I look at an AST node and I look if it's leaves. If any of its leaves are the error node, that AST node gets silently converted to an error node as well. It doesn't produce any more messages. It says, well, this is dependent on something that is wrong. So I'm going to mark this as wrong. So that's why I call it poisoning, because when a, 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 something is wrong in a leaf node, it's poisoned, and it poisons everything it touches, going back up the uh, AST node. And I found, to my, 
you know, great pleasure, that this almost eliminates cascaded errors. Now, D doesn't do this perfectly. It's still not 100% converted over from repair to poisoning, but it works great because when you see three or four error messages spit out by the compiler, they're almost always independent of each other. So it's really been a great success. Yes, sir. Yes. Would the way that be processed be that it starts parsing the integer, and then when it sees a sequence of numbers followed by white space, would each one become a new error um, node in the abstract syntax tree? Um, not exactly, because the parser is still repair and continue. It's the semantic processor that tries to repair things. But con to concoct a similar example, let's say you have an array literal with 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Now let's suppose that the second entry in there is erroneous. Okay? Something's wrong with it, maybe the type's wrong with it, so that gets replaced with an error. But the other entries in the array literal are not dependent on that one, so they're not poisoned. So the compiler can diagnose errors in the rest of those elements, and once that's done, then the array node itself is marked poison, but after all the independent leaves have been checked for errors. So that's also true like in a, in a function. You have a bunch of statements. They're all independent of each other except for declarations, so if you have an error in one, it poisons the function, but it doesn't poison the semantic processing of the subsequent statements because they're not dependent on it semantically. Okay, so anytime there's a semantic dependence on something that's poisoned, no more errors are diagnosed for that, and that thing itself is also poisoned. And you forget a semicolon. Let's suppose you have two statements in a function, and then you forget a semicolon after the first statement. So, how many tokens of the second statement are basically eaten up um, before you generate an error node and you start? a new, looking for new statements. Okay, um, that, the missing semicolon problem is not, and the poisoning doesn't work with that. That's part of the parsing, not part of the semantic analysis. What the parser does when it gets confused is it goes scan forward till it finds a semicolon. Just throwing things away, saying I, I give up on this statement, or declaration, or it, it scans forward to a closing curly brace which is called a synchronizing token, and it just tries to get the thing back on track again. So that's not part of the poisoning system. The poisoning system is in the semantic analysis. So. Okay, uh, it's become popular in compilers, and I jumped on the bandwagon, is that if you have uh, unde undefined identifiers, likely the programmer made a typo, transposed a couple letters, so the compiler has a little spell checker built into it. And the spell checker's dictionary is, of course, all the other symbols that are in scope. So it's a rather limited dictionary. And, you know, about 50% of the time it nails it. So that's pretty good. 50% 50 50 of the time is better than 0%, which is what the old one did. So the diagnostic is, you said foo, you know, perhaps you meant uh, food one letter off. It looks for differences of one letter. Andre. Five yes? Five minutes. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> I knew I was going to run out of time. Okay, constant folding. <laughs> 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 so that's one expression node in the constant folder, uh, Boolean expressions, and yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It just evaluates it at compile time, compile time function. Execution is, uh, as Stefan Koch uh, discovered to his chagrin, it's basically a glorified constant folder, not a proper interpreter, which is the source of uh, most of its uh, speed and memory consumption problems. Templates, they're stored as ASTs. So 
how they're instantiated is the AST is copied, the symbol table is constructed for it, and then the semantic analysis is done on it. I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> That's my office mate. <laughs> He's the one that, uh, the bad PRs are the ones that he puts in. <laughs> so, I think he thought I was not giving him credit, so he inserted that, I guess, into my presentation. Um, inlining um, pretty much is ASD substitutions. And this is an example of how it works. Uh, inlining of expressions can only have expressions inlined into it, not loops, which is a problem. So if the inlining is at the statement level, it can also inline loops. Okay, challenges for the compilers. Want to eliminate the global variables. Global variables are the spawn of Satan. And they're the source of nothing but bugs, and it's a constant issue to try to get rid of all the global variables out of the compiler. Um, trying to get a grip on the complexity. Um, reduce the cyclomatic complexity of the compiler. Um, code, code should have a nice flow to it rather than hopping around, which it does now. Uh, trying to change the data structures to eliminate special cases makes for a much nicer compiler. And of course, uh, reducing its memory consumption which I've been recently trying to do by trying to encapsulate things better so I can manage memory with very little extra added cost. More challenges. I learned more and more about encapsulation and things I thought were encapsulated were not. For example, a lot of the encapsulations leak details about how they work, which means you can't change the data structure without changing the code that accesses the container, which is, means they're not encapsulated. Um, now that it's in D, we get to use D features like const, pure, no throw, and at safe, which is an ongoing thing. And of course, removing the old C++ ways of doing things and converting to the shiny new D ways of doing things is an ongoing uh, challenge. So conclusion. I like working on compilers. I'll be working on them until my brain doesn't work anymore. People ask me how I stay motivated. I don't understand the question. I love to... <laughs> I'm always learning new things. It's always, it's, you know, to me, like finding a faster way of doing something is like other people playing a video game and getting to the next level. So, and I like compilers a lot more than playing video games. So, anyhow. Of course, anyone is welcome to contribute to the compiler. Just get on GitHub, fork it, change it, submit it. You could be famous, like Daniel. <laughs> so uh, that's my presentation. So we got uh, a couple I, minutes I, for questions. I would like to ask a question. Uh, you didn't talk anything about the machine uh, code. Uh, yes. Producing. Could you start over again, please? Um, what about the machine code producing? Producing machine, producing code. machine uh -huh. code. Uh -huh. uh, producing machine code is done by the back end, and that's a whole week's worth of <laughs> topic in itself, and I did not cover that here. Okay. Thank you. So the optimization, uh, instruction selection, and all that is handled by the back end. Hi. So, um, question about the glue layer because we have these three fantastic um, compilers in the D world, and one of the perennial frustrations is that LDC and GDC are always lagging a bit behind in the front-end version they support. So right. is, there, is there any work that can be done in the glue layer to facilitate just being able to drop new front-end versions in to, uh, uh, for, for all the different back-ends out there? Um, there are some pull requests to do that. I know that that is an ongoing problem and there is an ongoing effort to make that easier. And I also know that the GDC and LDC compilers have closed the gap quite a bit with DMD. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll probably sort of add to that. Um, there's also a lot of uh, competition between uh, the different backends as well because we all uh, want to. Uh, how, how do I put it? So we, we each have different ways of representing things, and so a lot of what DMD likes to tag in their front end has no relevance to either GDC or LDC. Likewise, you know, myself and David uh, or Kai. Um, we like to have more information available to us, but you know, it's, you know, it's kind of like competing with things that are, and so it's nice to have, a, I guess, a way to, to let any back-end uh, tag any metadata uh, against the front-end objects. Okay, I want to point out that this is Ian, who's in charge of GDC, so stand up, Ian, so everyone knows who you are. <laughs> And we have Kai over here, the LDC developer, who gave a presentation yesterday, so you already know who he is. And so he's, he's a big cheese around here. <laughs> and I'm, David, I believe, helps him with that. So next question. Um, yeah, me again. Um, so on the uh, back end is fully converted to D, so in five years or so. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what will need to stay in uh, C++ in the front end, what? because currently all classes in the front end are extended C++ classes, which, you follow me? The they're all C++ classes? Extend C++ classes, the, sorry. They're all extra what? Ex yeah, they're extern C++. Yeah, that's so they can hook up with C++ code. Yeah, um, will it stay like that in the future, or can I, okay. Yes. <laughs> The foreseeable future. Until we can, can convince the GNU compiler community to switch to D, you know, we're... <laughs> it's not impossible, you know, with the, the doubling of D in the last year, you know, any, you know, it doesn't take many iterations before they're more than the volume of the Earth. <laughs> uh, just a brief question. For those of us who are ramping up and trying to get more involved, what book do you recommend reading to get to know more about compilers and how to understand the code? Um, well, I haven't read any of the modern compiler books. <laughs> so I don't know, but the oldie but the goodie is the, the Dragon Book, which is, you know, the, uh, the uh, Hennessy, Aho, and Ullman book. It's called Compiler Design, and it has a dragon picture on the cover, and it's kind of the classic. And, most everybody starts with that one. The other thing is just simply read the code. The comments in the code are a great, are a great guide to how the thing works. And um, one thing that the books are lacking is how to make a real compiler work. And the, you know, there's a lot of dirty laundry in a compiler, <laughs> in any compiler. And reading the code will, you know, help a lot with that. It's like, you know, how I figured out how cars worked. I took them apart. You don't, you don't learn how cars work from reading a book. Um, Jonathan. Uh, how much performance does the program get from uh, inlining? And if it's significant, is there any guide or tips that one should follow to help the compiler to inline more? I'm having a hard time understanding. <laughs> Oh, how much extra performance you get from inlining? Oh, I think that varies very much on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, for one thing, the code has got to be hot code, oh, meaning it's executed a lot for you to see any measurable increase. And second thing is I think it's also highly dependent on the, which model of CPU you have, whether it'll pipeline across function calls or not. So the only way to really tell is, for your case, is to actually measure it. Yes, sir. I see now the on GitHub the source code of D, and I see there are not so many documentation in the code. Any plans to increase the documentation coverage for the compiler, or not for Forbes, for, for, but for compiler? Increase the what on the compiler? Documentation. documentation. Increase the documentation. Oh, well, now that we've converted the front end to D, we can now run DDoc on it. 
the documentation tool. And there's been some work in improving the comments to make use of DDoc. And there's even a site, I don't have the URL handy, where the DDoc version of the compiler front end is uh, displayed. Unfortunately, it doesn't look too good right now, but hopefully we make that a lot better. I have one question. Uh, like, do you have like a standard suite of tests to ver verify whether there are regressions in the performance by like speed and memory consumption when you make changes? Or you mean, is there a standard for that? Uh, no, if you have tests, like how if we make is there tests for it? Yes, yeah, so if we make a change to the compiler, is there a like a test suite that we can run and validate whether we regressed in performance? Well, there aren't really. Uh, any performance benchmarks. Um, generally, when I've published performance benchmarks, everyone tells me I'm cheating, whether I am or not. Um, so I generally tend to uh, let people run their own benchmarks and make up their own mind. And when I'm trying to make a particular thing go faster, I'll write a custom benchmark for that particular thing. Because there are different kinds of things in the compiler, and I maybe want to optimize this today, so I'll write a custom benchmark for that, just to test that. And like I might want to test how fast the memory allocator is, or how fast the string lookup is, or something like that. And do you submit those tests so we can run them after that? Or? Generally not, because they're just hacks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah. David. I actually just want to make a quick comment about the question regarding how to get started in compiler development. And I think the single biggest thing to do there is just start doing it. I mean, if you look at the history, I think Walter started working on compilers because he needed a faster compiler for his games. That's right. <laughs> I, like Ian uh, also doesn't have a formal background in, in, in compilers. And I also just started working on LDC originally because I needed a faster compiler for my project. So. Yeah, I want to say that working on games is a great segue into writing compilers. Because <laughs> yeah. there are apparently many compiler writers who came from being frustrated by the slowness of the compilers that they were using for their games. Me included, I think Jonathan Blow is another one. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I might justify myself. So, I wanted to learn a language, so I wrote a compiler for it. Um, <laughs> Well, D comes about because of my frustrations. I'm not very good at arguing my case to the committees and stuff like that. So I got tired of arguing, and I wanted to write code. That's really where it came from. Um, I guess uh, I, one more question, because I don't want to take up too much I, more time. No more question, but uh, just a comment. I also started with uh, uh, learning the small C compiler. So if everyone remembers this one, it's a very old one. And uh, for me, it was the first uh, compiler distributed in source code. And uh, this was uh, the, f uh, the first one I really tried to understand. And from then on, I always tried to do something with compilers. And uh, yeah, uh, I then wanted to write a database and uh, I looked for a compiler, and uh, then I discovered LDC, and that uh, was how I got in touch with LDC. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly glad that happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks for uh, listening to me, and on to the next one. <laughs>